mentioned in Brother Jack's prayer was the theme of this lectureship, God, the Bible, and Christian conduct, Christian living. And so this first lesson is very important to our daily conduct in being faithful to Him and properly expressing our love to Him because without God, there is no objective, absolute, moral standard. Brother Michael was born... Uh, 1922, I mean 52, in Pensacola, Florida, to William C. Bill and Peggy Hatcher. He's been a gospel preacher since 1986. He's lived as a preachers usually do in a number of places, Garland, Lubbock, Texas, and West Palm Beach, Florida, and a few other places. <laughs> Traveled a little bit around the world, too. His wife is Karen, former Karen S. Savage, Trenton, Texas who, by the way, his father had surgery today, and it all turned out very well, and we're thankful for that. I might mention, pausing here before I forget it, uh, that we also had, um, who else called in today? Paul Vaughn. Paul Vaughn, we mentioned here, we just saw a go going to have knee surgery, and he was able to call us after he finished with the surgery, and everything went very well, so I'll mention that now. Brother Hatcher graduated from Harding College in 1976 with a B.A. degree in Bible. And I won't go through all the other stuff. He's preaching at Bellevue Church of Christ, Pensacola. He's the editor of The Defender, a monthly paper, ever since uh, September of 94. He's the director and editor of the annual Bellevue Lectureship, 1995 to present, editor of their weekly bulletin, The Beacon. And I would urge you, if you do not get The Defender or The Beacon, that you'll be sure and do that. Uh, their lectureship books are some of the best, and they go back how many years, Michael? 88. 88, and... Uh, you'll find to be some good material to help you study the Bible. I won't mention some of the others. He's taught in various schools, helped us here with so many things, accounting a near and dear friend. And uh, we welcome him now to come speak on Without God, There is No Objective, Absolute Moral Standard. It is a joy to be with you again. It, uh, it's always a joy to come back and to renew old, dear friends. Uh, I'm just glad I'm not in that old part. <clears throat> Watch it now. Uh, also appreciate the Browns a great deal. Uh, stay with them each year and they always treat me royally and even the cats are treating me nice this year so but uh, it is a joy to be with you someone said just a moment ago that uh, this is the most important lesson that there is I said well that's probably not true but uh, I think you were just trying to put a little bit of extra pressure on me, but really Judges chapter 21 and verse 25 set the tone for this lesson because it states that in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Ultimately, <clears throat> It is left to every man doing what he thinks is right if there is no God. James Ekman was defining the word ethics, and he said it, it, it is a set of standards around which we organize our lives and from which we define our duties and obligations. It results in a set of imperatives that establishes acceptable behavior patterns. It is what people ought to do. Uh, he made a distinction between ethics and morals, morals being really what man does, ethics what man should do or ought to do. Uh, but that is a, a good working definition dealing with this subject. Can man, without God, discover or invent a system of ethics 
that is correct and binding upon man today. And so when you look at morality, it's either theocentric or anthropocentric. That is, it is either centered in God and thus he being the eternal source of goodness, or it is grounded in the mind of man. And in that case, man having evolved from inanimate forces. When we look at that area, though, of anthropocentric ethics, if you can call them that, when you look at the function of ethics as from a man-centered standpoint, there is the aspect of hedonism. Hedonism, the aim is the attainment of the greatest possible pleasure and the greatest avoidance of pain. But what if in my pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain, I must inflict pain upon you? In other words, I must act immorally in order to practice morality. That's what you have with this type of a system. And there is no motivation for an individual to forego his own pleasure in the interest of others. It is totally self-centered. So there's the other, another aspect, utilitarianism. It's built upon that foundation of hedonism, greatest pleasure and avoidance of pain. But they define then good as that which gives pleasure to the greatest number of people. Of course, there is no motivation to the pleasure of the many over the pleasure of the one. Why should I, as an individual, forego my pleasure for the pleasure of the greater good, greater number of people? Plus, there's no guideline in which to establish what is really pleasurable to the greatest number of good. How are you going to determine that? There's no way to. And what if some individuals have to suffer for the ultimate good to be accomplished? This is what you saw really with Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. We have to eliminate these people for the greater good. And so... They just go out and murder millions and millions of people. Why? Because it's going to accomplish a greater good. In reality, according to this view, what Hitler did was right and what he needed to do. There's a famous atheist, Bertrand Russell. His daughter wrote a book titled My Father, Bertrand Russell. Her name was Catherine Tate. And she was an only daughter, born in London in 1923, educated at her parents' school, Beacon Hill, which was an in institute dedicated to the promotion of atheistic humanism. She tried to explain what it was like being the daughter of the renowned philosopher. And Russell believed, even though he was an atheistic philosopher, that parents needed to teach their children Quote, with the very first breath that it has entered into a moral world. Of course, that's inconsistent. 
And he had a difficult time explaining just why. If a man is born just uh, and produced just as a result of natural forces, then children had to be taught morality, according to him. But she recalls that as a child she might say in connection with some moral responsibility, I don't want to. Has any parent heard that with their child? Or why should I? (laughs) Again, parents hear that on a regular basis. And what do we as parents say? Generally, something along the lines, because I said so. Well, a parent has used that line, I think. Or, your father said so. Or sometimes we, as Bible-believing people, might say, because that's what God wants you to do. Russell, however, would say instead, because more people will be happy if you do than if you don't. She would respond, so what? (laughs) I don't care about other people. Why should she in reality? And her father would tell her, you should. And in her innocence, she would answer, but why? And of course, the reason why is, Because more people will be happy if you do than if you don't. Of course, uh, she noted, quote, We felt the heavy pressure of his recititude and obeyed, but the reason was not convincing, neither to us nor to him. And that's true. But that's what you have when you take God out of the picture. Then there's evolutionary survival. That morality has been developed in the scheme of evolution as a means of survival. But when we go to that position, how was this decision made? Uh, How was it developed? that decision-making process, how did it come about? Of course, they can't answer that from the basis of evolution. And then who decides what will be the basis of survival in a competitive situation or society? Yeah, there is no answer. Darwin, of course, argued for the survival of the fittest. That's classical Darwinism. And thus, the moral thing to do is for the fittest to exterminate the weak. Again, that's what the Holocaust was based on. We are a superior race. All of these individuals, they're holding us back. They're causing problems in our society. We need to exterminate them. And so they did. Why? Because of the survival of the fittest viewpoint. We have to survive, and to survive in a better way, we have to eliminate those individuals. No one with that view, though, can draw any moral lines against a person who acts outrageously, like a Hitler. If that person claims that his action is a result of a personal sense of survival, if it is a personal sense of survival and you're dealing with survival of the fittest, if he wants to go out and murder anyone and everyone that comes around, then that's what he ought to do. 
And so his action, instead of being wrong, it is right in reality. Well, then there's the criteria for ethics in looking at this anthropocentric view of ethics. And the first of those is nihilism. Since there is no God, there can be no rational justification for ethical norms or laws. Since there are no rational justification for ethical laws, then everything is permitted. One philosopher stated correctly, everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist. Because just as in the passage that we began with, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Whatever I choose to do, no matter what it is, that's what I ought to do. And it is moral, even though for you it might be immoral. Because you choose not to do it, and I've chosen to do it. Then there's relativism, or sometimes put in connection with cultural relativism. It rejects again the idea that there can be a universal criteria for determining ethics ethics or values. Thus, all cultural ethical systems are equally valid. Whatever a cultural group approves of is right. Whatever that cultural group disapproves of is then wrong. Now, they're not going to remain consistent with that, of course, because they're going to say our decision, cultural decision, is right and yours is wrong. And what are they going to say if someone says there is an absolute standard of authority and ethics? Well, no, they say that can't be right. Oh, but wait, if the culture decides that is right, then it has to be right, but it can't be right. They cannot be consistent. These individuals, when you get again to the Holocaust, they generally will condemn what the Nazis did, even though that was the cultural decisions that they made in Nazi Germany. Thus, it was right, according to cultural relativism. But that cultural relativism eventually leads to individual relativism, which leads to social anarchy. Then there's situationalism. Again, it repudiates the idea of any absolute system of values. The rightness or wrongness of an action is dependent upon the situation. The only factor in making moral judgments then is based upon love. But in this type of a system, love is purely subjective. Whatever I think is loving or the loving thing to do then can be right but if someone else determines that's not a loving thing to do, then it's wrong. And so it, this idea of the loving thing to do becomes subjective. Joseph Fletcher is one who popularized this idea of the loving thing, and he went to the bases that the love or that loving thing was that which would bring the greatest pleasure to the greatest number. 
Heard that before. But what if I didn't want to? (laughs) Then there's determinism. This really absolves man of any personal responsibility. Man's conduct, your conduct, my conduct is the product of forces beyond our control. Remember Flip Wilson's The Devil Made Me Do It. Well, that's the idea of determinism. Thus, the terms such as good and evil are in reality meaningless. There's three types of determinism. The first of those is behaviorism. This says that the conduct of a person is is the product of his or our habit system. Man, of course, the animal man, because that's what they believe we are, that man, the animal, is the product of environment. Do we hear that a lot today in our society? This individual, oh, well, he might have done that, you know, stealing and killing someone, but he couldn't help it. The environment that he was raised in forced him to do it. He couldn't help it. That's what this is. His environment forces him and controls him in such a way that he can't do anything other than that which he is in the environment of. Then there's the sociobiology type of determinism. This tries to synthesize the social sciences with biology. That man is a mere machine that is programmed by his genetic makeup. Anyone remember the homosexual gene? That poor person over there who's a homosexual, he can't help it because he has that gene in him. How many times have we also heard about the alcoholic gene? An individual becomes an alcoholic because of his genes, not because of his choice. And so everything that a person does is a result of their genetic makeup. But then the third area of this would be the theological determinism. That is basic Calvinism, or which is warmed over Augustinianism. That man has a morally depraved nature. We got it from Adam. And when he sinned, that man became morally depraved. He is totally evil. He cannot do anything good. And God has predetermined what man will do. Now, there's the radical Calvinist who will say that God has predetermined every action, every movement that you make within your entire life, and you have no choice in anything. You are basically a robot that is simply fulfilling God's desires, doing what God's forcing you to do. There's those who have a modified system of Calvinism that they will just say, well, your eternal destiny is determined by God, and if God has determined you're going to be saved, then you're going to live that way. But they try and get away from that every aspect of your life, every movement that you make, every breath that you take, every word that you state, that God had before the creation of the world determined that you would do that, and you have no choice in the matter. So they try and stay away from that radical position, and they just modify it a little bit, but still it's a theological determinism, and you're not in reality responsible for your Actions. 
the results of the, these types of systems? Well, Jeremiah expresses, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And that Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, Solomon would write in Proverbs 14 and verse 12, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. All of these systems lead to anarchy in reality. It results in sin, wickedness, chaos. I wish we had time just to read Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, and going through the end of the chapter. But after talking about the fact that here's the Gentile world, that they are responsible to God because He has revealed Himself. He deals with the homosexual activity. And then, starting in verse 29, he says, "...being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. That's man without God. In Ephesians 2 and verse 12, you see that very thing stated that at that time, and sometime go back and look at that at that time. What time is he talking about? And that goes back to verse 1. At that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. These people who act in that way are without God in the world. And what we see in our society today, to a great extent, is as a result of taking God out of the world. When we see the abortions that are taking place in our nation and, and the world over, murders, how many of you watch any of the news at night? Do you go through a newscast without seeing all types of evil in this area, this city, this county? Or do you see murders and robberies and on and on you can go with the news? Why? Because these individuals are without God in the world. And when you take God out of the world, that's the result. And we're going to see the Euthanasia being more popularized. I mean, you older people like Brother McClish over there. He's old. He needs to be exterminated. <laughs> and when you reach a certain age, why, well, it's your duty now to end your life. You have become a Instead of helping society, you are taking resources out of society. And so for the good of society, you need to do away with yourself. Not only do we see the abortion, we see infanticide taking place. There are those now who are advocating that when a child is born, that child is not human. He will not become human until he's about a couple of years old, or some of them six or seven years old. So if you kill him, you hadn't killed a human being. Just a blob of tissue there. I'll tell a mother that. In reality, there are no rules. And no one would be able to say that anything that someone else did was ever wrong. The only other alternative, though, is a theocentric ethic. The human morality, as it is, is based upon the fact that God is the creator of man. 
Genesis first chapter. And that God created man as in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And that man is thus born or created in the very image of God. In verse 27, he says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created man in his image. And as a result, man is a moral being. Because he has a creator who is a moral being. And human morality, thus, is based upon the fact that God created us. And since God's nature does not change, remember Malachi 3 and verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. God does not change as far as his moral characteristics. Thus, that morality that comes from God does not change. It is absolute. And it is objective. It is outside of man. It is not based upon us. It's based upon God who gave it. The Bible then is God's revelation of that ethical code. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, which we rightfully emphasize so many times. To everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, that's in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God was revealing His righteousness to man and it's revealed in the gospel. I know what is right and what is wrong from an ethical God because He gave us the gospel. That's how I know what's right and what's wrong. 1 Corinthians the second chapter, verses 9 and 10. He says, that I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Oh, how many times that's misused for funerals in relationship to heaven. I'm not talking about that at all. It's talking about God's revelation that man on his own cannot know what God has revealed to us. That man on his own cannot come up with an ethical system by which to live. The only way that that can be accomplished is that, verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And so here is the Spirit revealing God's will, God's moral nature to man, so that man will know right from wrong. Man on his own can't determine it. As we see in our society today, sad to say. But God has revealed them to us. And thus the design for biblical ethics is first to develop in man right attitudes. Paul would write in Philippians 2 and verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God is trying to develop within us a mind that is following after God. That's the design of biblical ethics so that we will know God's will and we can live that. But it's right attitudes. In, Philippi, or in 2 Peter, the first chapter, verse 3 and verse 4, according as His divine power, we don't have time to discuss that, but that's God giving His revelation. That goes back to 1 Corinthians 2. According to His divine power, hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You want to know what is ethical in any situation? God has revealed what is ethical to us. 
But then go on. He's the, he has given to us by His divine power all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge. There's that knowledge. How does that come? That comes by revelation of God. By the knowledge of Him who hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Oh, how many sermons could be preached about the great and wonderful, the precious promises that God has given unto us? And Paul sums it up so beautifully in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 that all spiritual blessings are in him, in the church. So here, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers, and I said, partakers of the divine nature. What is it? That's right attitudes that God is giving unto us. And through that, we escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. You look at all of the evil that's around us in our society today, the only way in which we escape that is through the knowledge of God. And sadly, that's what we've excluded from our society. And that's why society is in such the state that it is. But the design of God giving us His Word is to develop those attitudes within us that we will do right. And then, second, to translate those right spiritual attitudes into right action. And that's what the Bible really is dealing with. In Ephesians 4, 22 and 23 that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. What is that old man? Well, go back to Ephesians 2. That's being without God in the world. That's what we see in our society. You put off concerning the former conversation or manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and that ye be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God... There's the right attitudes. He is created in righteousness and true holiness. We thus translate that attitude that God has given unto us into our actions. And thus, as Peter would write in 1 Peter 1, verse 15 and 16, As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, manner of life. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. God is calling us to be holy, set apart, distinct. We are not like the world. We're not living like they are. Why? Because we have a different attitude that comes from God and that attitude is translated into our lifestyle. And so we live a holy manner of life, a set apart lifestyle. And then third, it is to guide man back into accord with the divine ideal. This is dealing with our reconciliation to God. Man, because of his sin, separates himself from God, and his great need is to be reconciled back to God. In Titus 2, in verse 11 and verse 12, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us. There's that what we're talking about. That God is giving through His Word that ethic by which we are to live, that standard of right and wrong, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live righteously, soberly, godly in this present world. He's dealing with now. How are we to live? Well, we're to live according to those right ideals that are presented by God. That bringing us back in reconciliation with God begins in our conversion to Christ. As we come to faith based upon the proper evidence that has been given, we believe that God is, that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We believe that Jesus died for our sins. We repent of our sins. That is a turning away from that sinful old lifestyle, that old ethic by which we were living, and we turn to God's ethic. 
We're going to live now according to His will. We make that confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son. We're immersed in water, and in that immersion in water, our sins are taken away. They're removed. And we are now brought into a relationship with God. That's what Matthew 28 and verse 19 is talking about when it says, Baptized, King James says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's literally in two. You are coming into a relationship with God. Why? Or how? By your baptism. In that act of baptism, you're coming into that relationship with God where we now have those new ideals based upon the attitude of God. And then we continue in that Christian life to translate that word into our life. Leo Tolstoy said, quote, without religion, there can be no real sincere morality. Just as without roots, there can be no real flower. How true that is. Sadly, we have taken God out of our society. And it's our duty as Christians to go out and teach that divine ideal and morals. Hearty amen to that great lesson. Appreciate his good work his ability to preach the gospel and defend the faith. There can be no proper ethical decision without a proper knowledge of God's will. But there can be no proper ethical decision even if you have God's will, if you can't and won't or whatever reason correctly with the truth of God. Now we understand that when it comes to plan of salvation. Right. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, and so on. Thus, God, through His Word, reasons with us because He made us to be reasoned with. And when we stop reasoning, we're misusing what God made us to be, and we can't know the truth. So when we come to an absolute, objective, moral code, it's because we have been of an honest heart. We have understood all the Bible. God's revelation is taught on the matter. We have reasoned correctly with the information that's there. And we've drawn the conclusion that we ought to. And there's no other way it works. It works that way when it comes to what the church is, its organization, its work, its worship. And what we're talking about here in this lectureship, it also comes down to the living every day of our lives. And that's what was read and brought out toward the end of the lesson. Very, very important. The problem over the years, the last number of years, has been it wasn't that long ago when the, the laws of the land and the thinking of people in general were fundamentally uh, on biblical morality. They're not anymore. And that causes people, if you don't, you have to make that transition in your thinking. You can't depend on those things anymore. You've got to learn to stand on your own two feet in the study of the Bible and draw the right conclusions from the truth on what is ethically right and wrong. And be very careful in that area. Because you don't want, I don't, you don't, to be following your will in that any more than denominationalists are following their wills when they think they're doing God's will. And remember, the Bible has something to say about people who think they do God's service. And that was said in connection with the matter of persecuting the church. Well, we want to take about a seven or eight minute break, and then we'll come back for our final session. We thank you for being here. Be sure to register, and don't forget that. Thank you.